Yeah. So this is a paper that I'm going to do. We are going to do. Um, let me share my screen first. November 2021, uh, um, variant is two. And the uh, question, let's look at the first uh, question. So let's start with this one. Um, India's income has grown to its lowest rate. So let's quickly do this. I just want to sort of quickly check one thing before we begin our session. Give me one minute, guys. Okay, let's start. I saw, so this is the first question. Let's first read the um, our um, uh, data response. So this is India no longer the world's fastest growing economy. This came in November twenty twenty one. India's income has grown at its lowest rate in almost five years, according to the latest data released by the government. In the past financial year, April 2018 to March 2019, income grew by 6.8 percent. In the quarter between Jan and March 2019, it's expanded uh, by just 5.8 percent, falling behind the rate of China's growth for the first time in nearly two years. This means India is no longer the world's fastest growing economy. The new data makes it clear that India's single economic slope down. Unlike China, India's growth in income has been driven by domestic. Uh, consumption over the past 15 years. So this is more like a domestic consumption that is sort of dealing to so consumption is going up. But you know, China is basically very much like exports. So, uh, but data released over the past few months suggests that consumer spending is slowing despite the continuing growth in incomes. So motorbike and scooter sales are down, demand for bank loans has slowed, and India is leading. Uh, maker of fast moving consumer goods such as packaged food and drink has reported lower revenue growth in the past quarter. However, sales of smartphones uh, have continued to increase faster than incomes have been growing. All of these are important indicators of measuring the state of consumer spending. The government has promised that it would uh, cut income tax to ensure greater purchasing power. And some economists believe that the government should also consider cutting business taxes in the next budget, which will be announced in July 2019. These measures should act as a stimulus for the economy. India's government has promised to spend 14, 14, uh, 1.44 trillion to build roads, infrastructure, such as bridges, street fighting, but India's uh, largest, uh, large budget deficit might restrict the government's options. Many observers say that this money will have to come from the private sector. Experts say that the widening of fiscal deficit will hold back medium term and long term growth. Okay, so weak exports have also been a problem when it comes to creating jobs. In response, the government is expected to prioritize policy that will make Indian businesses more competitive. Calculate import expenditure as a percentage of total demand. So, guys, in this one, they're saying calculate import expenditure as a percentage of total demand. If you look at the information, import expenditure is basically, first of all, if you look at uh, this in quarter 2019, they're looking at this one, they give you C, I, G, X, this minus M. So, M is missing. So if I add these numbers quickly, if you add these numbers, the numbers will look like to be, let me just get my calculator out, 56.8 plus 31.8 plus 9.9 .9 plus 20. We're looking at this number to be 
8.5. If I subtract 100 from it, because percentage is always 100, we're looking at 18.5 to be equal to imports. Remember, C plus I plus G plus X minus M is your total GDP. So 18.5 will be the excess, which means imports is equal to 18.5. Have we got any questions about this one? Okay, then they say the Indian government promised that it would cut income tax to ensure greater purchasing power for consumers. Explain how uh, economists would measure the impact of a cut in income tax upon the demand for different goods such as scooters and smartphones. So guys, we know this that uh, if there's a cut in income tax, there will be a rise in income and a rise in income can result in uh, demand to change and we calculate through YED. Uh, YED is percentage change in quantity demanded of a good over percentage change in income. And we can look at basically normal goods where the demand will go up and the income go up and inferior goods will be where the demand goes down. Quantity goes down when income go up. So in this question, the first two marks will be given for the idea that you talk about that it is YD because it, responds, it measures the responsiveness of quantity demanded to a change in income. And you can tell us whether goods are normal or inferior. The second part says with reference to the data, explain whether the impact of income tax is likely to be the same on the demand for scooters and the demand for smartphones. And so basically here you talk about the idea that uh, if this thing with reference to data, if you look at data and the data that I have here, they're talking about scooters, they're saying I'm trying to find out the, the idea that was mentioned here. Uh, consumer spending is slowing down because of continuing with the income, motorbike and scooters. Motorbike and scooters sales are down, demand for bank loans is slowed down, but the demand for smartphones continue to increase faster than incomes have been growing. Our sales for smartphones have continued to increase faster than incomes have been growing, which means that from the data, according to data, scooters are showing a decline in demand. So scooters demand is going down. Uh, which means that if his incomes are rising, demand is going down, which means they must be inferior. But smartphones, their demand is going up, which means they are not. Okay? Or even luxury. Got it, guys. Any question before we move on? And this line is important. Continuing uh, faster incomes have been growing. And there's also another one continuing growth in incomes. So incomes are rising. And the demand isn't rising for scooters. Demand for scooters is going down. But for demand for smartphones are going up. Got it? So we need to explain that in this idea that one is a normal, one is an inferior. C says, using the information identified one policy, um, that could be considered a supply side measure and explain how this policy could make Indian businesses more competitive. So they give a supply side policies in this paragraph that say that India's government has promised to spend US 1.44 trillion to build roads and other infrastructures such as bridges and streets. But, um, and so you can talk about this as a supply side policies that they're talking about um, in, uh, sort of spending on roads and infrastructures such as bridges and street lighting. And the advantage of this could be, for example, uh, they can make the cost of production to go down. So the cost of production will go down because of the supply side policies, which will make aggregate supply to go to the upward and make the businesses more competitive because now the transportation costs uh, will go down. 
One is that problem. Uh, one is that uh, sort of uh, policy. They also talk about cutting income taxes to ensure greater purchasing. And some economists believe the government should consider cutting business taxes in the next budget. But if they follow this also, this also supply the policy that you can mention here and talk about how this will basically be regarded as more uh, market force of demand supply, allocating resources so this could improve efficiency in the market. But choose one and then write an answer accordingly. Okay. Now, guys, examiner actually mentioned one thing which I want to sort of uh, also, uh, like if you write income taxes, increasing demand, that's sort of supply side possible, uh, possibility or, or policy. But if income taxes are lower to make people more, incentivize people to work more because now they can earn more income or businesses to invest more, that is a supply side policy. Got it? Okay. Then comes this one. This says discuss whether the advantages of cutting interest rates in the economy could outweigh its disadvantages. Uh, well, uh, when you look at pros and cons of uh, cutting sort of uh, your uh, uh, interest rates, when interest rate goes down, okay, when the interest rates go down, they, it can make the AD go up. If AD goes up, there will be GDP going up. There will be unemployment going down. We call it expansionary monetary policy. There will also be a standard of living to improve. This was a possibility of standard of living to go up. But the downside of it uh, is that there will be inflation that can happen. Okay, you can talk about um, disadvantages could be also that, you know, when the interest rates are down, um, hot money flows out, which can basically sometimes result in your exchange rate to go sort of uh, down. And if, if your goods are uh, sort of inelastic, that could make your expense to go down. But uh, when the interest rates are down, it can also make your exchange rate to go down. And if goods are elastic, then expense can go up. So talk about pros and cons of that to also happen. But normally, a lower interest rate can result in basically a lower exchange rate. It can make the AD go up. It can make unemployment go down and so on. Now, evaluation can be basically depending on where the economy is. If the economy has a large unemployment, then this may not be a bad policy. In other words, what you're saying is just that if the economy has this kind of, a, you know, like LRAS, and let's say if AD goes up from AD naught to AD one, you will not see, you will not see your um, inflation to happen. Depending on where the economy is, the inflation will happen. So do talk about, you know, like, um, if unemployment is rampant, this may not be a bad policy to begin with. Okay. Remember, when interest rate goes down, consumption goes up, investment goes up because of cost of borrowing to go down. So that part you need to talk about because that is the link where the GDP goes up and then unemployment goes down. And because of income going up, the standard of living can also go up. And because of exchange rate, X minus M goes up. Okay, guys, any question before we move on? Okay, let me move on now to talk about the second question. This says that. Use a diagram to explain how PPC can be used to show opportunity cost and why such a curve is drawn with increasing opportunity. So, so PPC is a curve that shows various possible combination of two goods that an economy can produce using its resources fully and efficiently with defined PC. We draw a PPC which is concave to the origin. 
we talk about opportunity cost is the next best alternative for bomb. When you choose one uh, combination, you may not be able to choose the other combination. So a PPC shows opportunity cost because of the um, downward sloping graph, more of X uh, from X1 to X2, more of X will lead to less of Y, which means there is an opportunity cost. So the negative slope shows us the opportunity cost. And the fact is that because resources are not concave to the origin, uh, because the curve is um, concave to the origin, uh, let me go back to that question one more time. Uh, just let me finish this one. So guys, uh, because the curve is concave to the origin means that there is a rising opportunity cost. So the, there is an increasing opportunity cost. So there is an increasing opportunity cost, which means that resources are not fully mobile in alternative uses, okay? So resources are not fully mobile in alternative uses. So more of X is going to lead to less of Y. And uh, that also means that as we keep on getting more and more of X, we will be getting less and less of Y because resources which are well suited for Y are not going to be good for X because resources are not fully sort of versatile because of uh, which there will be an increasing opportunity cost. So define PPC, define opportunity cost, talk about what does the PPC tell us, talk about the slope of the PPC is negative, talk, talk about why there's a rising opportunity cost. That's an answer for this one. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, somebody was asking me about uh, the elasticity. See, if the interest rates are going down, right? Uh, if the goods are, uh, if your exports are inelastic, you always want the exchange rate to go up. Like for example, oil producing countries would want the exchange rate to go up because when the exchange rate goes up, exports become expensive. But if your uh, exports, uh, your exchange rate goes down uh, and your goods are inelastic, then your export revenue will fall. That was what, what I was talking about. Got it? Okay, this one says, uh, discuss whether the principle of comparative advantage concludes that a movement to free trade will always result in an overall benefit to uh, for an economy. So, uh, so B part is more about you know comparative advantage. So uh, you need to first talk about you know like uh, what is comparative advantage or principle of comparative advantage. Principle of comparative advantage says that countries that have a lower Opportunity costs should specialize in the production of those goods. Okay. And when they do so, they will be able to produce beyond its PPC. And if all countries do that, then this will result in overall. Uh, world efficiency to rise because then resource allocation will be very optimal. So discuss for the uh, principle of competitive advantage concludes that a movement to free trade would always result in an overall benefit. So when you are looking at uh, the, the question here, uh, the free trade will basically uh, uh, allow a uh, competitive advantage to be exploited. So free trade allows competitive advantage to be exploited and that could be uh, beneficial for the economy. Okay, however, when you look at the, the cons of free trade, 
they could be you know many because number one is that according to competitive advantage theory uh while we are able to do so it actually has a problem that number one it ignores transportation costs in your analysis it assumes constant opportunity cost okay it also basically uh, when you look at from the perspective of um, competitive advantage theory um, it may also uh, have uh, sort of um, um, it ignores any uh, trade barriers which makes it kind of unrealistic also sometimes um, you know like uh, other challenges may happen because countries may not trade with another country because of you know uh, reasons like like dumping or any unfair sort of trade barriers which needs to be considered as well so you may talk about whether the principle of competitive advantage can choose as a movement to free trade to always result and the answer is that there are challenges to the competitive advantage theory that we need to consider. Um, and uh, that's why sometimes it's not realistic. And uh, in your evaluation, you may want to sort of write about, you know, like uh, um, that when you are looking at free trade uh, and specialization, uh, while competitive advantage theory gives you a great uh, reason to specialize, it may have its challenges in terms of uh, uh, it may sometimes uh, because of transportation costs and uh, simplistic uh, analysis of constant opportunity costs and uh, ignoring trade barriers may not be realistic. Okay, so that could be your conclusion here. Have you got any questions? Okay, let me move on to the third one. Um, this one says, explain what is meant by consumer surplus and use diagrams to assess the impact of consumer surplus when an indirect tax is imposed on a good with price lasting a month compared with the impact when the demand is price in lasting. This is kind of like worded in a manner uh, that you could um, say your recent question will also be uh, asked when you, because they can say, explain what is meant by consumer surplus and um, use diagrams to consider the impact on consumer surplus when indirect tax is imposed on in last versus last. So what is consumer surplus? Consumer surplus is the difference between what consumers are willing to pay minus what they actually pay. Okay, it's the area under the demand curve but above the market price and if you look at it if this is my demand curve if this is my price this is my supply curve this is my consumer supply Okay, then we talk about when you put an indirect tax. Um, an indirect tax is a tax on expenditure. So we define what an indirect tax is. It results in supply to fall and the price of the good to go up. So when we put an indirect tax and you can draw two diagrams simultaneously, you can make an inelastic demand curve and you can make a elastic demand curve. And let's say you put a tax, you must supply curve X naught, price is P naught, quantity is Q naught, right? Supply curve shifts backward. 
you can see the price is going to rise by much more. The quantity will fall by little, right? So the consumer surplus, because the price is rising by much more, consumer surplus will fall by much more. So if this is my supply curve, Your supply curve is going to shift, but the price will not fall by that much, right? By that much in the case when the demand is elastic. So you need to talk about here that an indirect tax will result in the slack of to shift backward, the price to rise, but when their good is inelastic, uh, we would see the quantity to to not fall by that much, but the price to rise by much more. So that's one thing. The impact of consumer surplus will be basically lower um, uh, because the price is going up by much more. If you're saying, explain what is meant by consumer surplus and use diagrams to assess the impact of the consumer surplus when the indirect tax is imposed on a good that is in there. So here, the consumers, because the price is rising by much more, consumer surplus will fall by much more when the demand is inelastic. Okay, when the demand is inelastic, your consumer surplus will fall by much more. Are we good? So we need to draw the diagram. The impact of consumer surplus to be shown, how the price will rise by much more, and, and, and therefore consumer surplus will fall by much more. Okay. The B part says the government is considering whether to adopt a policy of maximum price in the market for food or to provide food subsidies to elevate hunger. Discuss whether maximum price legislation of food subsidies are more likely to elevate hunger under these circumstances. So, guys, a maximum price, adopt a policy of maximum price in the market for food or to provide subsidies to elevate hunger in a period of food shortage. So, when you put a maximum price, so what is the maximum price? The maximum price is put in a market when the price is too high. When you put a maximum price, we put it below equilibrium for it to be effective. When you do so, there will be a further shortage. So if uh, you look at maximum price, the biggest problem of maximum price is that it will lead to a higher shortage. So maximum price is imposed to keep the price of the food to be low so that you know, like low income people can afford it. Now, when you put the maximum price, it will create this shortage, which means that uh, there will be, unless you don't solve the problem, there will be a shortage, which means that already there was a food shortage and you are increasing it, which would be bad for the market because that will only increase uh, things to become more problem problematic. Okay, if the government decides to provide food subsidies, so this is basically another angle that you can talk about. It's just my demand and supply. A subsidy will result in supply curve to shift to the right, which will make the price to go down. And we have for the quantity to go up. So the advantage of food subsidy will be that food subsidies will reduce the price of food and increase the supply. But, uh, you know, like how much will it be able to increase supply or not will basically be depending on elasticity of supply because uh, you know like it could be a possibility that when you increase the supply the price falls but if the demand is kind of like inelastic here then the price will fall by much more and the quantity won't change by that much so that's another point that you can talk about and also uh, there is an opportunity cost involved because if the government is giving subsidy to one market, uh, you know, like there will be issues of, uh, you know, less money available, something else. Uh, subsidies are basically also going to be ineffective because here you have a, a famine or a, you have what we call a shortage. And uh, even if the, you give subsidies, it will not basically be supply if you have a, a food shortage because of a famine or because of, a, you know, um, uh, an environmental issue, which we can talk about. So there could be also a problem. It can, it may work in the long run, but may not work in the short run. 
and maximum price will have its own challenges unless the government doesn't you know like increase supply to you know like imports or something this will be problematic got it so talk about pros and cons of both these methods in the end you can conclude because you're saying uh, the the conclusion will be a maximum price could be effective if the government can also reduce the shortage by probably importing the good <clears throat> from abroad or otherwise you can say somehow if the government can do direct provision that could also be useful okay guys does that make sense any questions Okay, I'm gonna do the last one. Explain what is meant by inflation and using diagrams show how it can rise both as a result of a shift in AD and shift in AZ. So basically, inflation is a general rise in price level and it can happen because of uh, demand pull and uh, cost push. Demand pull happens if this is my AD naught and AS naught, a rise in AD which can happen because of uh, any rise in C, I, G, or X minus M for reasons not associated with price level. Talk about the idea that if, if the AD goes up and the economy doesn't have the spare capacity to meet the increased demand, there will be a rise in price level. Cost push inflation will happen if, if this is my AD, and AS, and there is a, a rise in cost of production. If there's a rise in cost of production, there will be a price level to go uh, up, and they can happen because of many reasons. Talk about the cost of production can happen on the uh, tax push, wage push, uh, profit push, uh, or important inflation, which can make the like, greatest black of shift backwards. So talk about both the ADAS and supply uh, the demand pull and cost push inflation. Okay. Are we good? Very straightforward. B page says to discuss whether the domestic effects of inflation are more serious than external effects. This is a very popular, it should be a very popular exam question. Basically, the cost of inflation can be many. There is a uh, shoe leather cost. Which is basically that the prices are going up and everyone is going to look for lower prices. There's a search cost, there's a menu cost, there is a redistribution cost, and then there will be a cost in terms of uncertainty. In terms of the external cost, I'm keeping this as internal cost or domestic effect, uh, will have uncertainty and X minus M. Okay, so domestic effects may include redistribution of health, two leather, menu, and uncertainty. Uh, the external may include your X minus M to go down, uh, which in turn will affect your exchange rate and which affect your com country's competitiveness in the market, but also uncertainty because people may not want to invest from abroad. Then we talk about which one is more serious it will depend on how big is your external sector, like China. As a huge external sector, and therefore their uh, risk will be much larger than, let's say, for example, another country where internal cost of inflation could be much more. Okay, so this is about the cost of inflation, and then talk about which one will have a larger problem than the other. Okay, guys, are we good? My question to you guys is that do you guys get a chance to see the videos that are shared online? I'm also going to share that on the all platforms. Okay. So let me share it on the all platform also, all of those videos. Alishba, which one this uh, conclusion? Do you want me to uh, repeat the conclusion? So this is about the cost of inflation. And then secondly, do you talk about 
in your evaluation you need to talk about because they say discuss by the domestic effects of inflation most you just it all depends on how big is your economy if your economy is a uh, economy that focuses more on international like for example we had a data from south china has a huge external sector while india doesn't have too much of an external sector um in terms of consumer demand so if your external sector is large then the cost of inflation will be much more i'm sorry it will be much less got it does that make sense alishpa okay guys thank you very much we are done i'll see you guys on the third now take care of yourself bye bye